Thank you for tuning in to the Student Organization Summit. Make sure to follow us on social media and check out the many other videos on this channel about working with and advising student organizations. And now, please enjoy your workshop. Hello everyone, our names are Kenzie Poston and Erica Lee, and today we're gonna to be discussing trans inclusive practices for student organizations. Um, we first just wanna thank you for your time um, and really your interest in this topic and for taking a little bit of time out of your day. Um, our goal for this presentation is just to give you a little bit of background and contextual knowledge on gender identity and expression um, and helping to create more inclusive and welcoming environments for trans and non-binary students at your institution. So for our agenda today, um, we'll do some introductions and give you a little bit more information about us and who we are and our work. Um, Erica will start us off with student org education, um, where she'll be breaking down some contextual knowledge around sex, gender, and gender expression. And she'll also be going over some helpful terms and suggested language. Um, after that, I will scaffold some skills and talk about action planning. Um, and it's really just kind of reflecting on how you're supporting trans students and how your organizations are supporting trans students. Um, we'll go over some pitfalls. Um, they're pretty easy to fall into, but they're also pretty easy to avoid, as you'll see. Um, and then some skills that you can help students at your specific institution implement or improve in their organizations um, in order to create more inclusive spaces. Hey, everyone. My name is Erica Lee, and I use she, her pronouns. I serve as the Assistant Director for Student Organization Development here at Clemson University and the Center for Student Leadership and Engagement with Kenzie. Um, I'm also an alumna of the University of Georgia and the University of West Georgia, so go dogs and go wolves, respectively. Um, but very proud to be a Tiger now and to be here uh, giving you this presentation today. Like I said before, my name is Kinsey Poston. Hi, I use she, her pronouns, and I currently serve as the Graduate Assistant for Student Organization Development at Clemson. I work with Erica here in the Center for Student Leadership and Engagement. I got my Bachelor of Science in Communication Studies and Journalism and Electronic Media from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, go Vols. And I'm currently a second year graduate student in the Counselor Education and Student Affairs program here at Clemson University. We wanted to start out with um, student organization education. So how do you talk about trans, non-binary and intersex issues with your student leaders? Um, of course, these populations will overlap, but um, definitely the student leaders who hold these identities, it's not their responsibility to educate other people about them. Um, so we wanted to give you kind of a baseline for um, common themes and topics and vocabulary as well, so that you can support your student leaders in engaging with this work and supporting trans, intersex, and non-binary students. So in this presentation, we're gonna talk about sex, gender, and gender expression, because these are different, separate, but interlinked categories. Um, and they definitely affect how student leaders can conceptualize um, and often misconceptualize trans students. So sex is often assigned as, at birth and is often assigned based on visible or observable characteristics of a baby when they're born. So um, typically people are sorted into male, intersex, and female based on these observable characteristics. Um, but there might even be more variance between these three characteristics based on the chromosome that they actually have, which typically aren't tested for um, when someone is born. We especially wanted to talk about intersex individuals in this presentation, not because they're always identifying within the queer community, but because they are often pushed towards or have medical interventions chosen for them without their consent, um, especially if their intersex condition is identified um, at birth, doctors and um, physicians can suggest or mandate that they have unnecessary medical interventions on their childhood. Additionally, trans individuals might have medical interventions kept from them, whether that be typical and normal medical care um, because of prejudice or access to, to healthcare, or if they'd like to have any medical transitions um, that might also be denied to them because of how our culture conceptualizes gender and, and what that means for people. Additionally, um, gender is a deeply held internal sense of self as a man, a woman, a blend of both, or neither. 
So gender is socially constructed like sexual orientation is. So um, your culture affects the way that you experience your gender. So it can correspond to or differ from the sex assigned at birth. Um, so for example, I was assigned female at birth and I currently identify as a woman. So I would be cisgender. Um, so that would correspond with the sex I was, I was assigned at birth. But if the gender that I experience does not align with that, um, I would be considered transgender. Additionally, we wanna talk a little bit about cultural context as well as the effects of colonization um, on gender and how people experience gender. In Western culture, we typically talk about gender as a binary, um, so women, men, et cetera. Um, but non-binaries have, non-binary identities have always existed and they exist today under several labels. Non-binary is an umbrella term for several identities if you identify as neither a woman nor man, um, or you can flow between genders or um, not having a gender at all, and those are gender fluid and agender. We also wanted to talk a little bit about these different perspectives of gender. So in Western tradition, we often talk about um, the binary genders of women and men. And the reality of gender might look a little bit more like this color wheel on the right, where um, people have different experiences of gender. For example, my experience so as, um, of my gender as a woman might not be the same as other people who identify as women. So having this visual might help kind of explain um, both the constriction of the binary as well as the, um, the reality of having multiple perspectives and having multiple genders. Lastly, we wanna talk about gender expression. So gender expression or gender presentation is a person's behavior, mannerisms, interests, and appearance that are associated with gender in a particular cultural context. So in a Western or United States context, we often associate women with femininity and men with masculinity in that traditional binary that we were talking about before. So that doesn't always track, for example. Um, someone can be very feminine presenting, but may not be a woman. Additionally, what is defined as masculine or feminine varies a lot depending on your social identity. So um, gender expression is often seen as a performance, like you put effort into, um, you put effort or you put a lack of effort into uh, performing your gender a certain way. Um, and so we can kind of see this as um, being layers. Um, so sex is so while sex is assigned at birth um, and it's more medicalized and gender is an internal feeling and then gender expression is the outward um, expression of your gender, it's the performance of it, it's the clothes that you choose, it's the way that you talk, it's, it's the way that you care for people, it's, um, those all have cultural connotations based on our society. So soon we're going to get into supporting trans identities, but first we wanted to make sure that um, we also had this baseline. There's no monolithic trans experience and um, different identities can affect people's experience of their gender, of their trans identity, um, and of their lived experiences as a whole. So we want to make sure that even though we're giving recommendations, the best practice is to keep learning, to keep striving for um, the most up-to-date information, and then to ensure that if an individual comes to you and says, that's cool, this is how I want you to treat me, um, to respect that above all else. Um, and there's always nuance and there's always um, considerations because people are all different. We all have um, different needs and different wants. And communicating that to your student organizations is going to be the most helpful information in getting them in the habit of getting them in the practice of supporting trans, non-binary, intersex individuals. So um, we wanted to talk about some helpful vocabulary and terms um, for moving from the language on the left towards the language on the right, um, unless a specific individual asks you to use it for them. Um, so instead of using the words transsexual or transgendered, these words kind of have a medical connotation as well as um, connotations with mental illness based on the access that trans people historically um, could get to medical transitions would be to have a medical diagnosis um, of transsexuality. And since that's, uh, that's an unnecessary like medicalization of 
their gender. Um, typically, it's not used anymore. Um, often, we use trans or transgender, um, and that also transgendered is um, in the past. And typically, like I experience my gender every day, so I'm cisgender, and the same linguistic legitimacy can be used for trans people as well. Um, additionally, instead of using normal versus transgender, using that often kind of suggests that the other thing on the other side of normal is other and not normal and possibly bad. Um, so instead using cisgender versus transgender, um, cisgender, using cisgender, especially as a cis person will help normalize that word and make people see that it's not a slur, it's just a word um, that you can use to describe yourself. So additionally, um, giving a trans person the almost legitimacy of saying that they are a woman or a man or the gender they identify as, um, instead of saying that they identify as a woman or a man, um, typically you wouldn't do that to a cis person. Um, so giving them that, that support. Additionally, a lot of people can't change their name for a multitude of reasons, um, a bunch of laws or their they don't have enough money to change their name, or if they're um, still living with their parents, for example, it might not be safe for them to change their name. Um, so instead of using that, it's their quote unquote real name, um, a better word to swap out would be their legal name, their governmental name, or their dead name. For example, if you pull um, names from a roster online, they might not exactly be correct, but um, you can choose to ask separately for someone's preferred name. Um, and instead, along those lines, instead of saying preferred pronouns, um, just like the identified um, as a man, woman, etc., cetera, um, saying preferred in, in front of someone's pronouns kind of pushes back that legitimacy of their pronouns. Um, but just saying like, these are their pronouns, um, that gives them uh, a, a support that you typically give um, other people. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about skill building and planning for equity. We're going to discuss some capacities and skills that you can help your student leaders develop. So first, um, and this can be something that you think about individually or you can pose upon your student organizations and have them kind of think internally um, how they are currently supporting trans students. And this can be through recruitment, in programming, in policies, and in interpersonal interactions. So thinking about kind of from start to finish, like when they are recruiting new members and they are marketing events and marketing their organization to how are they putting on programs and events that are inclusive for everyone? How do their policies reflect this? And then um, I think one of the biggest things about student orgs is creating that sense of community and sense of belonging. And within that is entangled a lot of interpersonal interactions. So how are trans students in your organizations and on your campus currently feeling supportive or not feeling supported um, in any of these aspects? So I'm just going to gloss over these common pitfalls because we discuss a lot of these um, kind of throughout our presentation and I'll be addressing a couple of them within the skill building, but I just want to touch on a few specifically. These are all kind of pitfalls to look out for. As I said, they are kind of easy to fall into, but if you're aware of it and you are engaging in that self-reflection and you, um, it's not too difficult to avoid these pitfalls. Um, so first and foremost is assuming that there's a one-size-fits-all approach to inclusion. Uh, this can go for any marginalized identity and any identity in general. Um, there is no monolithic experience. As we said earlier, there is no way that every single person on the planet with that identity um, feels the same things, needs the same things. Um, they're all individual people with their own experiences um, with other identities intersecting with those as well. The next one I'm gonna hit on is assuming you'll know everything at once. Um, I think it's a very dangerous uh, area to get into when we think that we know everything and we think there is no more knowledge to learn because there always is. We are always learning and growing in these practices. And so, you know, maybe reading a couple articles, reading a few books and assuming, oh, I completely understand the trans experience. No, not exactly. Um, those are wonderful things and they do build our capacity to have empathy and learn more about other people's stories. We will never understand everything at once. 
A next bullet I want to talk about is not thinking about inclusion while planning programs and recruitment assessment and other aspects of student or leadership. You know, inclusion is something that can benefit all students of all identities. And it's really about creating an atmosphere and a community of trust and sense of belonging um, and belief that you can go and show up as your full self. And that is really, it really lends itself to any identity. And lastly, um, trans and non-binary individuals are whole people with multitudes of identities. You know, they're not just trans or non-binary people. So um, avoid asking questions about inclusion only to trans and non-binary individuals and not asking about, you know, their hobbies. If they, maybe they like hiking, maybe they hate hiking, maybe they love cooking, maybe they hate cooking, you know, they are full human beings with the full human being experience. They are not just their singular identity. I will preface that these skills are geared towards students and these are skills that you can speak with them about and you can help them cultivate However, if you advise a student organization or you work closely with a student organization, these are definitely skills that you can take directly to heart as well. Um, but the first one is thinking about your own experience and knowledge surrounding trans and non-binary folks. So, you know, having students reflect on, you know, their personal biases and their preconceived assumptions about trans and non-binary folks is really the first step in supporting their peers and creating a welcoming, inclusive environment. Um, Self-awareness is a very crucial first step um, in knowing our own biases and our own unconscious thoughts. Um, we have linked here Harvard's implicit association test that can be a really great tool. Next up in the skill would be seeking out information to learn more about personal experiences. I've linked here PFLAGS, um, transgender reading lists for adults, which can help learn more about stories, um, complex legal issues, how to be a better friend and ally. There are several books on this list that are very beneficial to read. And next is the National Center for Transgender Equality. It can also be a great resource in learning more about supporting trans people in your lives um, and learning more about their experiences. Um, through seeking this information, it's important to remember that, you know, no one understanding encompasses the lived stories and experience of each person who identifies as trans. The next skill is um, to use inclusive language. So first normalizing pronouns and encouraging folks to use them if they're comfortable. Um, you can use them when you're introducing yourself and encourage other members to use theirs if they would like to, if they feel comfortable. Um, I would avoid making this a mandatory step in introductions. Um, encourage members to only share their pronouns if they're comfortable and if it's something that they would like to do um, and don't pressure them to potentially out themselves if they're not comfortable. Um, and in a virtual setting, pronouns can be displayed on your name next to Zoom, um, as well as if we, when we go back to having in-person experiences and name tags are being used, you know, encourage members to write their pronouns along with their names if they feel comfortable and they would like to. Um, second with inclusive language is, you know, if you make a mistake, correct yourself and move on. Um, you know, learning and using inclusive language is an evolving skill that um, and we are all bound to mess up at some point. If you happen to misgender someone, or if you use a term you didn't intend to use, the best thing to do is just correct yourself and move on. Um, or if someone else makes a mistake, simply correct them and move on. You know, taking a moment to correct yourself and not dwell on it can avoid, you know, bringing attention to yourself and potentially having someone else comfort you for your guilt. Um, but just the best thing to do is not dwell on it. Um, and then avoid intrusive or personal questions. Um, if someone who identifies as trans or non-binary wants to share something personal with you about their lives, they will. Um, but just be respectful of everyone's identity and their identity expression. Um, you know, in cultivating a space that is inclusive, people must feel respected for who they are. Number three is to integrate inclusive practices into your organization's legislation. So first, this can be as simple as adding language around inclusion to your organization's mission statement. Um, if an organization does not currently have a mission statement, this would be a great opportunity to create one and show current and prospective members like the collective purpose and values um, and that you are inclusive and you are welcoming to all students no matter what their identity may be. Um, we personally at Clemson use TigerQuest, it is on the Engage platform um, and we use it as a database for 
our student organization community, and we encourage our student leaders to put this mission statement up on their Tiger Quest page so that when prospective students are looking around for an organization they might want to join, they see and they know that that organization is going to be inclusive and that they are going to be welcome there. And so adding that language can be a pretty easy step, but add a lot of depth um, into being able to express that inclusive environment to prospective students. And second is add a clause into your organization's constitution to protect future and current members from bias and discrimination. Um, it can be helpful to look at the language used in your institution's uh, non-discrimination policy or anti-harassment policy um, to kind of mirror that language as well. So the fourth and final skill I'm going to discuss is making sure events are for everyone. There are a lot of different ways to ensure that your event is inclusive and welcoming to all. Um, and while this isn't exhaustive, these are a good place to start. Um, first is selecting an accessible venue and making sure that it accommodates all of your guests. Um, as I talked about earlier with inclusion, this is something that can benefit all members of your organization. Um, so when looking at accessibility, uh, this can look like making sure there is ramp or elevator access if stairs are required to move around the space, um, ensuring that there's enough room on aisles and halls for someone who uses a wheelchair, um, making sure that chairs can be removed from tables or accessible seating is available, um, ensuring that you're using a microphone when speaking to a group whenever possible, and utilizing closed captions on videos or being able to share a handout or share slides before. And then ensure that there are gender neutral restrooms for members and event guests to use. These may seem like small changes that you can make to your events, but they could be the reason that someone is not attending your event because they know that they will not have access to an elevator to get to the space, or they might be nervous about the seating arrangement, or they might not know if there's a restroom there that they're able to use. So by ensuring that you are providing these for your events and marketing them, it could be enough for a student to want to come to the event um, and know that they will be welcome and they will be in that space. When marketing your event, you can market it as LGBTQ plus friendly and let people who are interested in coming know that everyone is welcome. This can be especially helpful when you're hosting events that are for non-members to attend as well as members. And then when possible, use LGBTQ plus owned businesses when you're looking for vendors for your event. And lastly is um, amplifying trans and non-binary voices when you're choosing speakers um, to sure, ensure their voices are included. Um, however, along with our pitfall slide we discussed, um, don't only ask them to speak on their gender identity. You know, they are full human beings who have other skills and knowledges too. That's just a part of their experience. We wanted to discuss um, some learning and growth that we've seen with Clemson student organizations specifically, um, and some practices that we have seen them implement or know that they are planning on implementing. Um, the first is menstrual health, and that is more knowledge and awareness around menstrual health. Um, we have a student organization at Clemson that focuses on um, menstrual health and they are sure to include men, non-binary and gender fluid people that also menstruate in that narrative. Um, we know of student organizations that look at the campus map that we have on our Clemson app um, that looks for gender neutral restrooms for students to use. So they know that students coming to their events and coming to their meetings are gonna have a place that they feel comfortable using the restroom. Um, and then lastly, we have a group on campus that focuses around trail running, and they are considering adding a non-binary category um, along to the male and female categories that already exist. So these could hopefully spark some ideas that some organizations at your specific institution could implement um, and draw on. So we want to thank you so much for your time. Um, we know you're very busy people and to take your time out of your day to learn a little bit with us on supporting trans and non-binary students and student organizations. Um, this is something that we're really passionate about and we think is really important. And so we are honored that you took the time to learn alongside of us. If you have any questions about anything we talked about today or you would like to share ideas with us of things that you're doing on your campus, um, we would love to hear them and we would love to connect with you hear our emails, please feel free to reach out. We would love to chat with you and talk about the practices at your institution. Thanks for tuning in to the Student Organization Summit. If you're watching this live, feel free to reference the schedule for the day and use the link in the schedule to access a Q&A room where you can ask questions or chat with the presenters from this workshop. If they didn't list a Q&A link or you're watching this video after the event, 
Thank you for your interest in the Student Organization Summit.